Uh, well, hell, hey, everyone. Uh, it's me, your teacher, Pete. Um, look, I have a little uh, tiny me um, that I'm going to keep over here. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully he should be okay. Um, I hope everybody's doing okay today. Um, I'm down in my basement where I'm going to be making my videos. Uh, it's a little chilly down here, which is uh, why I got a sweater on uh, when it's really super hot outside. Um, people, I'm going to try to make these videos as short as possible. Um, this one might be a little bit longer than some of the other ones um, because what we're talking about here is, uh, in my mind, super duper important. Um, and I would say uh, really close to the most important thing that you're going to uh, uh, learn all semester. <clears throat> so um, hopefully uh, after I talk about this stuff, you will see why it is that I am and why it is that I think it's so important. So um, here's the deal. Um, I'm going to uh, read a little something from Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I don't know if you all know Kurt Vonnegut. This is his book, Time Quake. This is where my reading is going to come from. Um, if you don't know Kurt Vonnegut, uh, you should because he's from Indiana and he's one of uh, the 20th century's great novelists. Um, Y'all may have read Slaughterhouse-Five or Cat's Cradle or Breakfast of Champions or something. Wrote tons of books. Um very much so an Indiana person, though he spent mm, a huge chunk of his later life in New York. He always wrote about Indiana, always put Hoosiers in his book. Um, so at any rate, uh, you should. there's a museum in downtown Indy uh, devoted to Kurt Vonnegut. Um, you should check that out. Um, this is from a chapter from this book, um, which is a novel, but like many of his novels, it steps back from time to time, and uh, he talks about his brother, and, and Kurt Vonnegut's an old man when he's writing this book, and his brother's an old man, too, and his brother, during the course of writing this book, his brother is dying of brain cancer. And so from time to time, <clears throat> while he's writing the novel, he kind of steps back and talks about his brother for a few minutes. Um, and it's mostly really sweet. Um, and so this is a chapter, uh, a short chapter from that book. Um, if you've had me before, you've heard this spiel before. Um, but again, I think that this is just super, super important. So um, let me show you here uh, what is going on with this chapter. I'm going to try to go through this relatively quickly, people. Um, it begins with a uh, question, what is the white stuff in bird poop? And then the answer is, that is bird poop too which is not the funniest joke in the world. Um, on the other hand, it's one of those jokes that sort of relies on the fact that sometimes the most obvious answer is the right answer. Um, and that's going to apply here to what we're talking about. So, um, he says, get a load of this. My big brother, Bernie, who can't draw for sour apples and who at his most objectionable used to say he didn't like paintings because they didn't do anything, just sat there year after year, has this summer become an artist. I shit you not. This PhD physical chemist from MIT is now a poor man's Jackson Pollock. He squeezes glurbs of various colors and consistencies between two flat sheets of impermeable, permeable materials like window panes or bathroom tiles. He pulls them apart, et voila. This has nothing to do with his cancer. He didn't even know he had it yet. He was just farting around one day, a semi-retired old guy without a wife to tell him uh, not to do it, and voila, he's making art. So you get here what his brother is doing. He's got like two things, uh, like a window pane or a tile, right? And he squeezes the paint onto the window pane. He takes the other one, puts it on top of it, pulls it apart, and says, ah, art. Now, um, we have uh, uh, one uh, sort of black and white uh, example of what his brother's talking about. Uh, Kirk uh, says that he sends him some colorful ones that are real cool. But this is an example of the black and white one, right? You put the thing down, you pull it apart. Now, I just want to point out that uh, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, when his brother asked, is this art or not, the answer would have been very clear, which would be no, this is not art. Um, but we live in a different time period. Period, right? Where there are people like Jackson Pollock and abstract expressionists, etc., um, who paint things that people uh, often wonder why is it art or is it art? 
Um, and so <clears throat> the message that he sent along with his Xeroxes, because he sent Xeroxes of, the, of some of the paintings, um, was not about unexpected happiness. Um, he wrote, is this art or not? He couldn't have put that question so jeeringly 50 years ago before the founding of the first Holy American School of Painting, Abstract Expressionism, and the deification uh, in particular of Jackson um, Pollock, who also wasn't a very good drawer. And so um, those of you who are, uh, we've all seen Jackson Pollock paintings, um, whether you know it or not, but I want to point out um, what his stuff looks like. It is these giant... Sorry, why am I having trouble finding it? Um, these giant splatter paintings. And you've seen this sort of thing before. Um, oh, oh, yeah, here's some good examples. All right. And, and here's... Oh, oops. Those were upside down, people. Look, here's a, here's a picture, a couple of pictures of Jackson Pollock painting them. He laid the canvas on the floor and uh, he walked around dripping the paint all over it. And so they called him Jack the Dripper. Um, and he is at the front, forefront of what we call the first Holy American School of Painting, which is abstract expressionism. If we break that down into two sections, right, we've got abstract, we've got expressionism. Um, abstract uh, generally means generally means that uh, what we're seeing here is non-representational. Now, there can be sort of abstract works that are representational, but we're not going to get into all of that. Um, when we talk about abstract, we're talking about in general non-representational stuff mm, that is not a picture of a chair it's not a picture of a person it is uh, uh simply <clears throat> right a picture of paint and so you know what people say when they see um, um abstract expressionist work um what do they say they say oh i was going to give you another example of abstract expressionism <clears throat> um Here's one that I, I want to say. So this is representational to the extent that here we can see a woman, right? Um, but uh, we would call this abstract expressionism, right? Um, and so abstract in general means that there's nothing there. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I broke tiny me. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Well, we're going to have to fix that, people. I am so sorry. Uh, what a wonderful thing this was to be, have sitting here, and now to have it broken is just truly, truly upsetting. I don't think it can stay like this. All right, people. Uh, okay. Um, so abstract, non-representational, um, expressionistic, um, Expressionistic, I want to say, is the degree to which the, the painting expresses itself. For instance, you know, um, nobody is going to look at the Jackson Pollock paintings and think that he painted every single one of those splatters. We're going to recognize immediately when we look at that 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 is splattered paint. Um, and so uh, the painting itself shows how it was made. Now, if you think about like the Mona Lisa, or you think about old paintings, et cetera, you can't tell how they were made. There's no brush strokes in them. They're beautifully done. This is what the masters did, is they were trying to recreate real life. They didn't want the painting to look like a painting. They wanted the painting to look like the thing that they were painting. And things that they were painting didn't have brush strokes in them, et cetera. So their paintings are all smooth and beautiful, et cetera. Well, obviously, once we have the uh, uh, camera, the, the need to be uh, photorealistic in painting no longer matters. We don't need a painter to take a, uh, a paint a picture of the king or whatever. We can just take a picture. That leaves painting wide open for all sorts of other stuff. Now that it is not simply a way to represent uh, uh, people... Um, because we don't have cameras. Now, all of a sudden, cameras can do that better, and it frees up painting to do all sorts of stuff. Okay? So, Jackson Pollock, first Holy American School of Painting. Um, it's abstract. It's expressionistic. Again, when people see that kind of work, you know what people say. They say, I could have done that. Or they say, uh, uh, ape could have done that. Or a child could have done that. Which is, uh, I want to say, probably true. But that doesn't mean it's not good art. Now, so uh, uh, let's let's move on here for just a, a second. Um, 
He would not sign his pictures. Bernie, this is what he said. He said, he wants to know if this is art or not. But he would not sign his pictures or admit publicly that he had made them or describe how they were made. He plainly uh, expected puffed up critics to sweat bullets and excrete sizable chunks of masonry, i.e. shit bricks, when trying to answer his cunningly innocent question, art or not. So, his brother wants everyone to look at these paintings and go, is that art or not? I was pleased to reply with a epistle which was frankly vengeful. I said, dear brother, this is almost like telling you about the birds and the bees. There are many good people who are beneficially stimulated by some, but not all man-made arrangements of colors and shapes on a flat surface, essentially nonsense. So what is a painting? It is a man-made arrangement of shapes and colors um, on a flat surface. It's nonsense. It's not anything. You yourself are gratified by some music, arrangements of noises, and again, essentially nonsense. So what is music? It is an arrangement of noises. That's it. If I kick a bucket down the cellar stairs and say that that's as good as an opera, this would not be the beginning of a long and upsetting debate. You could just say, I like what Mozart did. I didn't like what the bucket did. Okay, so listen here. He says, contemplating a purported work of art is a social activity. Either you have a rewarding time or you don't. You don't have to say why afterwards. You don't have to say anything. But I want to point out, we do say something, right? We don't go see a movie and not talk about it with the people that we saw it with. Um, art brings us together. It is a social activity. When you listen to music, you share it with friends, etc. Um, it's a social activity, which is why in this class um, and in my creative writing classes, you're expected to talk, you're expected to share your work, because this is for social activity, right? Um, he says, you are justly veered experimentalist, dear brother. If you really want to know whether your pictures are, as you say, art or not, you must display them in a public place somewhere and see if strangers like to look at them. That is the way the game is played. So you, if you've got art, um, if you've been writing poems, you've been making music, and you wonder, is this good? Is this art? There's one way to find out. You put it out in public in front of strangers, and you see whether they like it. Um, if they like it, great. If not... Now, obviously, this is complicated because, right, like, so say, Van Gogh, when he comes out, everyone thinks his, his painting is nuts and nobody likes it. Um, and then here we are, you know, whatever, 150 or more uh, years later, um, and everyone loves his work. So his work didn't change, but the way that we approached his work changed. Um, so... He goes on, people capable of liking paintings or prints or whatever can rarely do so without knowing something about the artist. Again, the situation is social rather than scientific. Any, this is beautiful, ready? Any work of art is half a conversation between two human beings and it helps a lot to know who is talking at you. Um, there are virtually no respected paintings made by persons about whom we know nothing. We can even surmise quite a bit about the lives of whoever did the paintings, the paintings in the caverns underneath oh, France. Um, so, right, even the cave paintings in France, we have a good idea of the people who made. We don't know the exact artist, but we look and we try to find out and we see what their society was like. We try to see how they painted their pictures, etc. So. He says, I dare suggest that no picture can attract serious attention without a particular sort of human being attached to it in the viewer's mind. If you are unwilling to claim credit for your pictures, to say why you hoped others might find them worth examining, there goes the ball game. Pictures are famous for their humanness, not for their pictureness. I went on. There is also a matter of craftsmanship. Real picture lovers like to play along, so to speak, to look closely at the surfaces, to see how the illusion was created. If you are unwilling to say how you made your pictures, there goes the ball game a second time. Okay? So um, he's telling his brother his brother needs to do three things with his art if he wants to find out uh, um, something, whether it's art or not, whether people enjoy it. Those three things are you got to put it in public, you got to sign your name to it, and you got to be willing to talk about it. Which is, when you think about it, a pretty low standard for what art is. I mean, I could simply go, doo -doo -doo -doo, I'm going to sign my name to this, I'm going to display this in a public place, um, and uh, uh, I'm going to find out whether it's art or not, right?
people are going to look at that and they're the, going to decide. Um, now, that was pretty easy to be an artist, right? All I had to do was make something, I show it in public, and I'm willing to talk about it. Here's my name. You can talk to me and ask me what I meant with this, okay? Um, those are the three things that an artist does. They show stuff. Their name's attached to it. They're willing to talk about it. There are exceptions to this rule. Um, we like the idea of the, the great artist who is unknown during their time period and becomes much famous later, like Emily Dickinson or Van Gogh, etc. That happens very rarely. Almost all artists show their work. Oh, well, and even Van Gogh and Dickinson tried to show their work. They just weren't successful at it. Um, so... Um, the question I have for you is if making art is so easy, if this is all you have to do, sign your name, put it up, and be willing to talk about it, my question is why isn't everyone an artist? Um, most of us have done something uh, creative at some point in time, right, either because we're pissed off at someone and we write, I hate you, you fucking bitch, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> We all do that, but why don't we show that to every single person uh, in the world? Why don't we put that up on the wall and ask people what they think about it and be willing to talk about it? I would say um, that there are various reasons. Um, one reason might be, well, okay, maybe you don't want to be an artist. Maybe you're doing it just for yourself and you don't want people to look at it. You don't want to hear what other people say about it. That would be one reason not to show your work that you've done. But I'm going to say the main reason why people don't do their creative work, don't show this in public, even though it's easy to do, the main reason why they don't do it is for some type of fear of rejection. You put your work out into the world, somebody's going to say, that sucks, and you're going to feel bad about yourself because we've been taught that art is dredged up from our soul and that art represents our soul. And if somebody rejects our art, it's like they're rejecting us personally and it hurts really bad. Right, And because of this, most people are very scared to show their work to people. Um, they are scared of getting hurt. They are scared of being rejected, which I understand because nobody likes rejection. Nobody likes that. Um, having said that, uh, uh, this to me is the big secret about art that nobody talks about, right? Ready? And uh, uh, again, uh, to me, um, this is like the big thing. Ready? If you're an artist in this world, no matter who you are, no matter how good you are, you are mostly going to face rejection. It doesn't make any difference the quality of your work. People are going to reject it almost all the time. Um, and this is tough. And I don't say this to make you discouraged that like, oh my God, your work is going to be rejected. I say this to make you realize that all artists are in the same boat right? Um, and so everybody is in this situation where when they put themselves out there, the risk of rejection is high. Now, um, if you wonder uh, uh, what I mean by this, like, you know, just doing a little experiment with your friends, though your friends probably listen to the same kind of music you do, um, maybe throw out some, uh, some famous musicians, like who likes Beyonce? And you raise your hand. Who, who likes Justin Bieber? Uh, who likes Taylor Swift? Um, who likes these people? And what you're going to find is that even these, and I'm talking huge artists, right? Taylor Swift, etc. This is as big as you get. What you're going to find is that even in the demographic of young people who, who Taylor Swift should be sort of appealing to, even in that demographic, huge chunks of people don't like Taylor Swift. Right. Um, I'm guessing and I, I don't know. Right. If I were to be in front of a classroom of 20 people and I said, who likes Taylor Swift? We might get five, six hands. I don't know. Maybe we get half the hands. But even if we got half the hands, that's half the time being rejected. Right. And we wouldn't get half the hands. And again, you know, you take someone like me. I love Bob Dylan. Right. Love Bob Dylan. How many people like Bob Dylan? Millions and millions of people. How many people dislike Bob Dylan? Way more millions and millions and millions and millions more right and so um do this with your friends check let's say who likes Jimi hendrix who likes mozart who likes picasso who likes uh, da vinci you take this greatest artist in the world and you're going to find that the vast majority of people don't really enjoy him and like so for instance me taylor swift i would say yeah it's okay i like it that's all right my daughter likes it a whole bunch i think it's you know sort of okay, 
And then there would be a lot of people to say, oh, I hate it. That's horrible. I don't like that at all. Imagine how that feels for Taylor Swift, right? Um, no doubt it would be very painful for her, and she would write a song about it, etc. We don't like to be rejected, and yet artists face rejection. That is what happens. If you put your work out into the world, the vast majority of people aren't going to like it. Okay, so um, don't be scared of rejection, because rejection is what the game is about. Um, I know that that uh, ain't easy, but again, I want you to recognize that you are in the same boat as all artists. It doesn't make any difference if you're super duper talented or not talented at all. Most people are going to reject your work. So once you realize that, you can start sort of detaching yourself from the idea that all criticism is a direct thing against you, um, which brings me to another point, um, which I want to say... Uh, <coughs> um, um, I want you to start thinking about your work as not dredged up from your soul. It is not you. The poems that you write, they are not you. They are just something that you thought at one particular moment. They are a small chunk of who you are. Um, if you were to uh, write it again later, you would probably say something slightly different. Um, <clears throat> So, what am I saying here, people? Um, I'm saying everybody gets rejected, right? Um, uh, and so anticipate that and don't feel bad about that. I'm also saying here, don't think of your work as being your soul. Your work is simply something you make right? Um, and it is not your soul. And even if I tried to put all of my soul into a, a writing, I would be unsuccessful with this. Um, you know, I could tell you uh, uh, my relationship with my dad. I could write a giant novel. I could write a series of books, not novel. I could write a series of books about uh, my relationship with my dad and you get done reading them all and you still wouldn't understand it all because I cannot put all of me on the page. I can't do it. Even even if I tried, I couldn't do it. So when people reject it, they are not necessarily rejecting you. Now, we've been taught that they're rejecting you, but let's start thinking about art as not your soul. Art is something you make. That's it. People like it or they don't like it, fine. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the artwork. Um, okay, so um, rejection um, is a very important part of being an artist. Um, it's something that happens all the time. Um, okay, so you're not going to be concerned about rejected be rejection. You're not going to think of your art as a representation of your soul, and that too is going to help you not be concerned about rejection. Um, there's a couple of other points that I want to make um, that I think are super essential to uh, this idea of being an artist. Um, one is the, the preference that we put in this world on the idea of meaning and, and what does something mean. And most of us were taught about poetry by people who knew nothing about poetry and they would show you a poem and they would say, what does it mean? And you would say, I think it means this. And they would say, no, you're wrong, it means this. Um, as if poems are simply about what they mean. Um, I just want to point out in this world that most of the great stuff that I experience in this world, I have no idea what it means. I love my children. I don't know what that means. I enjoy a beautiful day outside. I don't know what that means. Um, I can enjoy a sunset. I don't know what that means. But that does not stop me from enjoying it. Or a song. You know, you don't listen to a song and go... Um, um, you know, you might, you might listen to a song over and over and over again, think this is great. I love this song. And then you realize it's about suicide, right? Um, that doesn't matter. It sounds good, right? It doesn't change the fact that you were dancing to it. Um, so the meaning of the artwork is one of the things that we'll talk about, but it is not the end all. Okay. Um, what something means, I would argue is a horrible way to go about life trying to find what everything means. Instead, um, instead of trying to find out what everything means, let's enjoy those experiences. Instead of me trying to find out what it means to love my children, how about I just enjoy loving my children, right? Um, and so <clears throat> when we read stuff, we might talk about the meaning, but that's not the end all of what we're talking about. Um, Art is an experience, right? It's an experience. And you either, as Kurt Vonnegut says, you either enjoy that experience or you don't enjoy that experience, just like in life. 
And again, meaning has very little to do with it. So asking what something means is to me sort of a, a, a goofy question that uh, gets into all kinds of stuff that we don't want to get into. Because what does anything mean? Nobody knows. Okay? So we are not going to look at, at words and art as just communications of meaning. They are not just communication of meaning. Um, and so we're not going to privilege that over beauty and sound and fun and all of the other things that a poem can do. Likewise, um, I want to uh, point out the idea of simplicity. Um, people tend to think that art that is simple is somehow not as valuable as art that is quote unquote complicated. So again, when people see abstract expressionism and they see the paint splatters, the reason why they say I could do that or a child could do that is because they don't think it's very complicated. I, th I, I think if you actually did it, you'd find it. It's relatively complicated, but they don't think it's complicated. They think it's simple. And if it's simple, that's not good enough. Um, and, and it always strikes me as one of the, the funniest cut downs of something to say, I could do that. As if saying, if I can do it, it must suck. Um, but listen, um, simplicity is not a bad thing in this world. Um, I would argue that some of the greatest stuff in the world is exceedingly simple. Um, you know, um, complexity, um, you know, if all we cared about in art was complexity, you and I, we would all listen to nothing but symphonic music where we have um, many, many instruments involved. It's long, it's complicated, there's a ton of stuff. But no, we like to listen to Kanye where there's just a simple beat and he's rapping over it. That is simple. But that does not mean it's not as meaningful as Mo Mozart. Some of my favorite music is old blues music. It's simple. Super meaningful, right? Super important to me. It does not matter that it is simple. Um, again, if you look at other things in the world like that, it would be a stupid way of looking at the world. Um, you know, the tax code is complicated, but, but the golden rule is pretty simple. Which one's better? I'm going to say the golden rule is better, right? Um, hurdling, um, um, hurdling um, running down the street and hurdling things, um, that's complicated. What about just walking? Well, that's simple. I'll take just walking, right? So um, art is not judged, should not be judged exclusively by whether it is simple or not simple. Because for one thing, right, well, I don't even know what simplicity means, but for two, that's not what matters, what matters is, do we enjoy the experience? And again, almost all of us enjoy the experience of things um, that aren't necessarily complicated. We enjoy simple music. We enjoy listening to rock and roll where the chords are all the same and the melodies are roughly the same and the instrumentation is the same. We enjoy that. We like that just as much as we like Mozart. Um, simplicity can be a beautiful thing. So in this class, we are not going to, um, uh, 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 what, what would you say? We're not going to privilege the idea of meaning as being more important than other things. We are not going to privilege the idea of complexity being more important than other things. We are going to um, recognize that the way that art is uh, determined is by putting it into the world and that when you put it into the world, you are going to face rejection. But you're not going to worry about that because you know that's what everybody else in the world goes through. That is what it means to be an artist. And, um, of course, that's somewhat, uh, uh, what, ironic and painful when you consider the fact that most people consider artists to be relatively sensitive human beings. And yet the, the game that they're in is a game that is full of rejection. So, people, um, what is art? stuff you put into the world. If you wonder, if you ever walk into a museum and you see a Jackson Pollock painting or you see, you know, a, a painting that's all white and just has a red stroke on it, and as people say when they walk into the museum and they see something like that, they say, why is that here? What, why is that great art? Why is it in this museum? Um, and I'm going to tell you why. Ready? Because people like it. And you might not like it, but people like it. Some people like it. And you might not understand why it is that they like it, but it's simple. Art that is famous, art that is hanging in the museums, is art that people like. And why they like it, that can be a mystery. That can be something that we can talk about. Um, but it's easy. You're not being tricked, right? Art is what people like.
Um, and so, uh, man, I hope all this stuff makes sense to you. Again, this is really important to me. This is super important in terms of how we're going to uh, move about in this class. So, um, I hope everybody gets what I'm saying. Um, I hope all of this makes sense to you. I hope you get why this is so important, right? Um, and, uh, oh, people, I will try to get my little mini me fixed so that um, he can uh, sit here with me and that can be really enjoyable. Um, you know, I'm gonna do the best I can with this guy. Um, Hopefully this all makes sense to you. Sorry the video was so long. I will try to make the videos in general shorter than this. But again, this is the beginning of the semester. This is an important thing. This is something that I really think we should be talking about and taking the time with. And that's why I did it, people. Um, I hope everyone has a great day. Um, be ready to talk about this stuff in class some. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you whenever it is that I see you. Um, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.